Here's your introduction to vectors, which is also your introduction to chapter three, dealing with 2D motion. In other words, we're going to be looking at objects that are traveling in the X and the Y direction simultaneously. So instead of only moving forward and backwards, they're going to be moving forward and down at the same time, or they're going to be going across and up in the air at the same time. So projectiles, all right, like launching a football or throwing a baseball from the pitcher's mound to home base, that sh general shape that you would be seeing. Uh, that's what these notes are going to be over. So a good place to start is a review on a scalar quantity versus a vector quantity. This is never going away. We're going to look at these throughout all the chapters. So the first thing here, what you need to remember with scalar quantities are is these are values that show magnitude only. Now magnitude's like the numerical number, so like 16 kilometers, 14 meters per second, for instance. Those would be magnitudes. Some examples of these magnitude uh, variables that we saw in chapter 2, 1D motion, were if it said a distance of, or if it said a speed of. So this would be two examples of scalar quantities. Guys, what's missing from that? Stop and think about it. If I only tell you 16 meters per second, 14 kilometers, then what am I only telling you? I'm only telling you the magnitude, right? So what does a vector quantity have that a scalar quantity does not? Well, it does have magnitude. So a vector quantity is still going to give you that same magnitude of 16 kilometers per hour or 14 kilometers, but it's also going to tell you direction. So you'll know if you're moving 16 kilometers towards the east, 14 meters up, 13 kilometers to the left, something like that. So the examples of the variables that you saw vector quantities for in chapter two were instead of distance, we called it displacement because a direction was given with it. Instead of speed, we talked about velocity. And then once you knew the velocity and how long you were gone, the third variable that we looked at that was considered a vector quantity was acceleration. Now, something I want to point out is you would think that 2.99 is going to be a scalar quantity and positive 10 would be a vector quantity. Yeah, you're 100% right, but here's something extremely important. We are going to, Mr. Dillick and myself, are going to assume now that you guys totally understand that if you just write down 2.99 meters, we know that you are implying that that is insinuating the positive direction. Either the object is moving up, it's moving backward, it's moving to north, it's moving uh, east for instance. It's moving towards the right. So that would imply a positive direction, not necessarily a positive number. Remember, we're, we're not talking about numbers here that are positive and negative. They're magnitudes that are assigned a direction. Okay, so really this whole idea of a positive 10 meters per second, don't worry about that anymore. Just as long as you write this, you're totally fine. So to be 100% honest with you, what we are looking at here then is this actually can go down here. And then clearly negative 9.81 meters per second squared would be an example of an acceleration that you could put down here as well. All right, so vectors, looking at a vector. A vector is an arrow, okay? This is what I want you to really pull out of this slide, is that vectors are arrows. They are arrows that point in the direction of motion. So if I'm heading towards the right, your arrow is going to head towards the right. If I'm heading south, my arrow is going to point towards the south. So the head of the arrow is pointing in the direction of travel. In other words, the direction of motion. The length is equivalent to the vector's magnitude. So let's jump down here real quick, guys. So here you see a vector arrow on a line. We'll get there in a second. You see a vector that is uh, so much at 10 meters. And then you see another one over here that's shorter than, and this one that's shorter than says that it has four meters underneath it. Well, that makes perfect sense, but wait a second. There's something else that we need to remember to assess here as well, because these are vectors, i.e. vector quantities, then clearly is what we want to look at. So not only do you need to look at magnitude, you also need to apply the direction to these. So look at this 10 again down here at the bottom of this current slide, guys. Would you assess that as a quote unquote positive 10 meters, or would that be a negative 10 meters? Well, look at the vector. Is the vector heading towards the right or the vector heading towards the left? Is it heading towards a positive quantity or a negative quantity? Well, it's a positive quantity. 
But remember what we had just said on the previous slide, don't worry about putting that plus in front of there. We totally get that you understand that that would be a positive 10 meters. Okay, so clearly something's wrong with this four meters then. There should be like some screeching nails on chalkboard at this point. The four meters is heading towards the left, which is the opposite direction. So once again, stop and think of it this way. You, you know a, a, a given direction that something is traveling, so just arbitrarily, that's like your positive way that you're moving. So if you're moving in the opposite direction, then it should be the opposite sign that is being assessed to the problem. Makes sense, right? So technically, you should have a negative put in front of that four. Not necessarily saying a negative four meters as in minus four meters, but it's four meters in the opposite direction of what the previously stated 10 meters was in. Okay, back up here to a resultant. For a resultant, you're looking at the sum of two or more vectors. So the result of adding these things together um, is called your resultant vector. Very, very, very important here. When adding, make sure that all vectors have the same unit. So you don't want one that's in kilometers plus one that's in meters plus one that's in, I don't know, decimeters. You need to make sure that they are all in the same unit in order to get the resultant vector. Like, what is the result of adding these guys together? Okay, next slide here. So vectors can be added graphically. And what I mean by that is skip down here to where this like big uh, uh, picture is that says, what's wrong with this picture? Well, look at this. <laughs> Excuse me, you got some heads going together, you got some tails going together. You don't want to see that whatsoever. You want these to always be head to tail, head to tail, head to tail. Stop and think about this. Put your, yourself literally in this scenario. I first walked purple and then I walked green. Green. Well, wait a second. No, I didn't. I walked purple and like this burgundy-ish color at the same time. Clearly that's impossible. You can't be walking two different places at the same time and end up at one place. You're not Schrodinger's cat here. <laughs> okay, so anyways, what you want to do is rearrange this picture so that you can see that you are constantly moving in the same direction. Guys, very important, you have to keep the magnitudes constant because if you change the magnitudes, then you're goofing around with the final value that you're going to get. And you should understand, like check this out, it says vectors can be added graphically, but also vectors can be added in any order. Vectors can be added in any order, it's just that the magnitude has to stay constant with it. So let's rearrange some of these and make sure that our magnitudes are staying constant. So I'm gonna move this orange one over here and I'm going to move this burgundy-ish colored one right here. I'm going to move the black one right there. That makes sense, right? Now, is this the only possible picture that you could have created? No, nope. you could have done so many different ones as long as they were going head to tail, head to tail, head to tail, head to head tail. I first did this, and then I changed directions and went here, and then I changed directions and went there. Here and there need to stay same magnitude-wise, but how you got from here to there adding vectors in any order, it doesn't matter. It does not matter, just as long as your magnitudes are staying consistent. Okay, continuing on. So to add these vectors graphically, in math class you use the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Well, what we're going to use in physics, and this should make sense, is your x-axis squared plus your y-axis squared equals your resultant squared. I stuck this d squared in here because for some odd reason your book uses it, but really d means distance, and you're not solving for distance. So, grr. What I really would like you to write down when you're solving for magnitude quantities is, yes, Pythagorean theorem, but physics is x squared plus y squared equals r squared. <laughs> Excuse me, where r stands for your resultant that you will be solving for. So this is the equation that I want you to use for like your, in your guess method, the E of your guess for like challenge problems, targeted homework, practice problems. If it asks you to solve for the magnitude of this resultant vector, then you would want to use quote unquote Pythagorean theorem, but in the physics sense of x squared plus y squared equals r squared. Okay, cool. So what direction were you heading in? Well, the direction is going to come from one of your trig functions. Think back to uh, trigonometry or maybe even geometry with different angles and stuff, where you have sine is opposite over hypotenuse, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, and tangent is opposite over adjacent. So you're going to solve for the angle's direction. So down here we have listed that so <laughs> is the sine, which is opposite over adjacent. Ka is cosine, which is adjacent over hypotenuse. And toa is tangent, which is opposite over adjacent. Well, where does this even come from? This is in relationship to theta. All right, well, <laughs> I understand.
understand what you're trying to say there, Miss Arter, but I don't understand it without a picture. Cool, let's draw something. So let's say you first traveled this way, and then you traveled that way. So what if you would have just done this, and then you wouldn't have had to turn it all? Where's theta go? That's like the craziest part, right? Like, how do we know where to place theta? Here's the trick to the trick. As long as you draw your triangle correctly, and you'll draw your, your resultant, I'm sorry, that's not what I meant to say. You'll draw your component vectors, x and y, correctly if you get the direction correct. So your x first traveled towards the right, clearly, and then you went up, so your y is going to be positive. So you should have a positive x and a positive y in your givens. Um, remember to include your units with your givens, and unknown, and final answer. Okay, anyway, sidetracked. So theta. Placement of theta is always going to be between the first vector drawn and your resultant line. Theta will go between first vector drawn and resultant line. So, should theta be placed in the bottom left or the top right here? I think, clearly, if this is the first vector that you drew, was this one right here, and here is your resultant line, then theta should go right there. Right? Cool. Cool, yeah. So now, look at this. You have your opposite side, you have your adjacent side, and you have your hypotenuse side in relationship to theta. So that's how you'll determine if you want to use your sine, cosine, or tangent function. Well, what did they give me? Did they give me opposite in my resultant? Did they give me opposite and adjacent? Did they give me adjacent in my resultant? What I mean by resultant, guys, is your hypotenuse side of the triangle. And that'll help you assess, do I want to use sine, cosine, or tangent function? Okay, continuing. Um, we're going to stop here on this video because bow tie triangles and hourglass triangles is going to be one video in itself. Extremely important. I'm going to entitle it just bow tie triangles, hourglass triangles. Because you'll be using this with chapter 3, you'll use it in chapter 4, you'll see it somewhat with 5, but it's just not going away. So I want to keep bow tie triangles and hourglass triangles something that is separate. Just looking ahead here though, we'll use that then to figure out magnitude by using Pythagorean theorem, and then using direction by figuring out which trig function is appropriate with the given triangle. And then we're going to look at a sample problem, and then finally get into your different practice problems of A and B here. So we should be able to stop on slide 15, and that's what we'll be due for chapter three, practice A, B, once you get done with slide 15. All right, guys, let's go ahead and stop here. We're gonna pick up with the second video, which is going to be entitled just bow tie and hourglass triangles. Please watch that one as well. And then the third video will be uh, summing it up with your practice problems. Cool.